what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a period of, you know, roughly somewhere between 10 and 20 years. And I'm going to try and draw a narrative across various experiences and, and various projects. And it all starts in the late 80s and early 90s at this place in the Philippines that Julie mentioned, the International Rice Research Institute. So here was I, this really enthusiastic young scientist, much more hair, much less gray, got this great opportunity to go and work in this fantastic environment. The government was paying for it. We were learning about how to measure microbial biomass in soils, how nutrients were turning over. The reason why we were doing it is because folks were worried that if you intensively cultivate, cultivate rice production systems, maybe there was a de decline in the performance of that soil and the productivity of, of the system. It was a tremendous experience, and things I learned then I'm still using today. Um, and there were great weekend getaways. It was a fantastic place to be working in your kind of 20s and 30s. Um, and, and so all was good. But then in 1997 in the UK, something happened. And there's a prize for anyone who can guess what that is. Anyone know what happened in 1997 in the UK? It's a big deal. The Labour government was elected. Tony Blair became Prime Minister and Claire Short became the Minister for Development. And that has a profound influence on everything that I'm going to talk about today. Because with that change, there was a clear policy focus. And that focus was that we're going to eliminate poverty. Right? We want to eliminate poverty. That was the British government's position. That's where they wanted to be. And so for people like me who's research was funded by DFID that had all sorts of implications. I'm going to tell you how it impacted upon me. It's not, you know, there's people who would look at it from other perspectives and tell it in other ways and with different context. But there's something that we'll all remember is that underpinning this strategy to eliminate poverty, someone called Diana Carney, conceived or put together this framework for an analysis of livelihoods. And some people in the room will remember us standing, scratching our heads, looking at this schematic. Because remember, I'm a soil scientist, right? And I'm trying to understand how soil science and soil microbial biomass and the things I know about crop responses to nitrogen fit into this much broader picture which is saying, you know, if you want to make an impact on livelihood, you have to understand how people transact their livelihoods. And, and you've got a kind of a context, which is there's things around you, shocks, culture, trends, things that impact upon your life, wherever you are in the world, right? And you have assets. And those assets or capitals, it may be the natural resource that you're drawing upon, and societies around the world draw on their natural capital in all sorts of ways. We could think perhaps how we use oil. Um, social capital, who you know, what your connections are, where you fit. Um, human capital, the resource, you know, your body and, and your family. Physical capitals, things you own. Financial capital. So there's these assets that we draw upon. And depending on, in, in some ways upon the assets you have, you then influence and, and access stuff around you, these policies, institutions, and processes, and, and this stuff affects how we can prosecute our livelihood. And then there's outcomes, you know, more income, increased well-being, reduced vulnerability to those trends, shocks, and culture, improved food security, more sustainable use of a natural resource base. Well, actually, I believe that soil is the most important asset that we have, a natural resource that we have. Others might argue that water's more important, but you know, soil is pretty critical, actually, to how we live our lives. And we're all living through a time, actually, of shocks. You know, we debate whether or not climate change is real and what's weather and what's climate and so on, but I think we can see that there is a perturbation on our environment, whether we're in a developing country context or a, a, you know, a, a first 
world context if you want to use that term. But anyway, this framework for livelihood analysis was a bit of a shock to our soil scientists. We had to start to negotiate our research in an entirely different context. And you know what? We had to change our geographic focus because eliminating poverty. Poverty is about people. Where are the people? So suddenly, I was spending a lot more time in Bangladesh, Nepal, and India, and a little bit in Pakistan, because there's millions and millions and millions, or hundreds of millions of people. Um, and, you know, I highlighted up here the Indo-Gangetic Plains. We'll talk about that in a, in a bit more detail. It's 17% of the land area of South Asia. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a population of 450 million. And it produces a lot of food. And it was highly productive. Fertile soils, favorable climate, extensive water. So for someone who'd come out of a high intensity of rice production, it was a place that I could go and hang out. Or the research and the organizations that I were in, was involved with had some relevant knowledge, right? Um, and then these relationships were starting to change. We started to look at those policies, institutions, and and processes at a very simplistic level. You had DFID, the UK equivalent of USA, the government body that funds international research or international aid. Now, the bulk of their money moves through these bilateral programs. So India and the UK agree funding programs and development targets. That was actually completely independent of the natural resources research, which was funded out of the UK. And with that came all sorts of challenges, right? Because we're trying to negotiate our research in the context, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars to maybe millions, in the context of people who are spending tens to hundreds of thousands of millions. And so they think they're more important, right? Basically. Um, and more than that, we were Another part of those institutions and processes is people started to realize that sticking a DFID-funded research institute in the middle of Nepal and staffing it with predominantly English lead scientists wasn't necessarily the best way to create a, a change in a country. You needed the leverage of working with the national government institutions and other institutions in that situation. It's different in every, every country. But our role was changing. We had to be part of a partnership or a relationship, but we weren't going to get a budget and a Land Rover anymore. Um, so then we're, we're working on, on focusing on research partnerships and supporting and facilitating projects led by national agricultural research partners. I'll talk about that a little bit more, assuming that we keep somewhat on time. Because there's a lot of lessons in that and, and stories that you can share. But basically, our relationship is fundamentally changing in terms of how we're interacting with our partners in, in our research. Now, I said that there was a timeline. Roughly speaking, we're going to run from 1997 actually to the end of this stuff that started in 2012. So we're going to end up at about 2016. And there's a number of of kind of key points in this that I'm going to talk about. This is where it all started in some respects. I'd come back from the Philippines. I was based in the UK. The Natural Resources Systems Program was funding research where they brought all sorts of people together to define um, their kind of research targets. And then there's a channel of research and activities that followed from that, and various different DFID agent or different components of DFID get involved in supporting it. So I said we'd gone to Asia. I said we'd gone to the Indo-Gangetic Plains because it was super fertile, lots of people. Then there's this thing that we moved east, right? We moved east on the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Now, remember, I've never been to India at this point, right? So it all sounds good to me. Well endowed with natural resources, low potential productivity. We've got these nice little schematics that came from that workshop in 1997. I even drew that as the rapporteur for the group that was talking about high potential productivity with some 
famous Eric Craswell, I think it was, uh, was kind of facilitating the group. And you know, we all got together and asked meaningful questions like, how can we increase productivity of existing resources? Eastern Indo-Gangetic Plains are characteristic, characterized by extreme poverty, yet high potential production. So you know what? Scientists from India, from the Indian government's Indian Council for Agricultural Research could get behind this because it kind of fitted with their strategic thinking. Um, and, you know, scientists who are used to talking about genetic potential and yield potential and modeling stuff could get behind it. And we could ask, you know, deep questions like how can we accelerate the adoption of technologies and how can we improve the livelihoods of the rural poor people? That was a new one, by the way. And so that set the context. There was enough of a consensus that the Indian government could sign off, the English government could sign off, and I was not smart enough to realize what I was getting into. Um, so then we go to Bihar in India, and I haven't got a photo of my first visit to Bihar, but this serves to introduce a concept. There's a lot of really poor people there, the government has been very difficult in, in eastern India, in the various states, over many years. Um, the infrastructure is poor. There's all sorts of constraints to production and improvement of livelihoods that have got nothing to do with the fertility of the soil or the potential productivity. And I hadn't quite understood that when we talked about moving east. Some of my colleagues would debate you know, the environmental factors, but the, the reality is that there's a whole, if we go back to that livelihoods framework, there's a whole load of other stuff that was affecting the production of agriculture in, in northeastern India. So infrastructure, governments weaker, land fragmentation, and significant poverty. So I was beginning to wonder what kind of mess I got myself into. Um, especially as my boss at the institute I now worked at in the UK was much more interested in papers in nature and super fantastic measurements of organic matter. They were happy when they got the news of the grant, but less happy when they understood what I was doing. Um, so here we are, we're in India, right? This is a pretty classic picture from a research project in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And I'm pretty pleased, I haven't put on much weight since then. And I haven't lost much hair, right? So there's garlands, there's four-wheel drives, there's stuff going on, right? I don't see many poor people. In fact, I don't see any residents from, from the area. Oh, there's a few rich people over on the um, back over there. And there's the four-wheel drive that we got there in. Um, and so that's kind of where we started. And here's my other aha moment, right? This is probably my second or third trip to Bihar. So I already got the shock of realizing what we were in for. But here we were you know, pronouncing on this rice. Actually, it's not rice. I think it might be wheat even. Um, but the point was we were wandering around. And I, there's a certain moment where you have to say something smart, right? And, and so there was this field that looked really bad. And there was this field that looked a lot better that someone was standing in. And they were, you know. One was over there and one was here. So I, I just kind of thought, OK, we'll ask why this field looks much better than this field, right? I don't speak the local languages or dialects in any way at all. So I asked it in my fine British accent. Someone translated, and it kind of rippled around, and there was a bit of giggling and, 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 and so on. And the answer that I got back was that this field that looked really good was being managed by a sharecropper. And this field that looked really bad was being managed by a landowner. And they had completely different incentives and constraints. This person was talking about unavailability of labor, timeliness of crop establishment, and so on and so forth. This person was hustling to make a buck on land they didn't own under a relationship with the landowner that was probably not entirely fair to them. And their only means of success was if they got this field to work. So that was another thing that kind of got into my head at that point, right? So then, this is the sort of thing that I used to feel good about then. This is not in India. This is from a project that we were doing in Bangladesh. And look at this. We did clever stuff like have these participatory 
events, participatory rural PRAs, I even forget what they stand for. But anyway, you get people together, they, in this instance, they've, they've got a big problem and they're looking at the, the root causes of the problem and they're putting little beans or seeds or something to prioritize these things. And then it gets taken to some group which is geographically distinct from here where there's some summarization that goes on. And then, you know, someone writes up a report and, you know, we get something like this. You know, the problem is not enough food. The solution is build a diversion grain, drain and gully, right? This comes from a DFID project, a DFID program, the East India Rainfed program. I can't remember how much money they got, right? Now, as part of my experience, this was shared with me by a colleague who'd been working on the development side of that project. And he said, John, what was the problem? Wow, it's clear. Whoops. How did I do that? You got that. It's clear, right? We need to diversion drains and vegetative measures and, and contour bumps. And he said, no, the problem was there's no money to buy food. Right? We've, we've, we've not followed that chain at all. And they never did, right? And he said, for a, a while, this was a really successful project. Do you know why it was really successful? Any guesses? It's because they paid people to do this and they could buy food. Yay! So, I just flashed it up. 450 million people. That's the project. You know, that's the challenge, reaching 450 million people. So we didn't, not only did we have to reach the poor and socially disadvantaged, which unfortunately didn't own or manage rice land in the irrigated commands where our project was supposed to be focused, typically. Um, but we had to reach hundreds or kind of show a path to reaching hundreds of millions of poor people in remote, poorly served rural locations. So now we're getting into the research now. And this is a picture from our project. And there's some real achievements here, right? A, these scientists are out in the field, at least talking to some people. And this guy is kind of my guru. And he's not formally educated, but he's being offered the respect of sitting alongside his colleagues from within the Indian government system. And there's some stuff going on. But there's also a four-wheel drive in the background and a banner and chairs and people sitting down. So it's not really, we're not really, we're making progress. And I was stuck at this point, right? I was trying to explain this livelihoods framework, which no one understood. I'd got this in group of Indian government scientists who had a mandate and a direction from their employers. I had my boss who had a completely, and, and funder who had a completely different view of the world. And we were at an impasse. And the solution that I came up with is, I can't fix this. I can't sit in a room with these people. No amount of PRAs in the world is going to fix this disconnect that exists between the various actors in this project. And so what we did, and, and you could say this was accidental management, I don't know, but Sunil, who you saw here, his role was to form groups. And how many projects do you see where you say, we will form self-help groups to dot, 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 our technology, right? So that was his role as conceived in the project. Sunil was going to form self-help groups. But he was whispering in my ear a whole load of stuff that seemed entirely sensible to me, which he was never going to ex get chance to kind of research on if he formed groups for our project. So I said, you know what? We're just going to kind of take a step back here. And Sunil and his colleagues had space to do what they wanted to do. And my other colleagues had space to, and, and that, this includes international scientists as well, had space to what, do what they do. And what, what Sunil was leading becomes Roji Roti. We'll talk about that in a, more in a moment. But the key thing that they had identified and wanted to trial was that if you don't buy the motorcycle and pay the person 12,000 rupees to ride the motorcycle to the village, to form the groups, you get a number of benefits. You get a much more intimate contact with your community. You get a much lower cost of engagement. 
and, and they demonstrated that you could work within your villages to identify individuals who could become part of a self-help group formation process. So we got into self-help group formation and microfinance, a topic I'm entirely qualified to be involved with, clearly as a soil biologist, <laughs> right? So here's what they were doing. Conventional approach, we've gone through that. That We called this in the kind of mid-phase of what we were doing, the dialectic approach. I think dialectic means kind of challenging, right? So what we did is I just said, look, there's poor people here. We don't need to argue about the details. We know there's poor people. We know there's agriculture. That's good enough for me. And we're going to focus on how we enter into villages, develop that human and social capital. We were encouraging savings and credit within groups, and we were looking to link to external credit. On this side, you know, we were doing chickens and I don't know what else. And we were monitoring, this is the important point here. We were monitoring inputs, how much we spent, what we did, monitoring inputs. Here, we were, letting, we were le having confident that demand for something was going to emerge at a group level, that that would be met by entrepreneurs and agricultural extension in various ways. It was cheaper, and we were going to monitor outcomes, livelihood outcomes. And these ladies here, uh, people who became volunteers were part of facilitating this group formation process. And you can see that the clothing is starting to change. The nature of the dynamic is starting to change. And as a soil scientist, I started to learn that this was telling me I was reaching poorer and more socially disadvantaged people. And a real key, key finding in the first phase of this project was to capture our group savings. We had to introduce a unit in our database, because we had databases underpinning what we were doing in various ways around the, the groups. So we had to have a unit of less than one Indian rupee. Anyone know how much a rupee is? How, or how many rupees to a dollar today? Pretty close. It's 72 according to whatever I found today. But I'll take 67, right? So when you think about that, that's like two cents. Right? Two cents people were saving. And we said, that's OK. Right? The other thing we did was we said, you know what? It's your money. It's your group. Use the money. Spend it. And the group started lending money to themselves. That sounds kind of run of the mill. But actually, it wasn't run of the mill. Because for most groups, they were being forced to create a fund to demonstrate that they could have a certain amount of money on deposit in order to access some program or funding. So the notion that you should actually spend your money and rotate your funds was actually quite new for this old guy. Um, the other thing that we had to live with is, is that people didn't spend money on rice and wheat and chickens. Well, they did. They had agricultural inputs. was a pretty significant expenditure, but early on, you know, people were spending stuff on, on social needs, on personal needs, on recreation, on medical stuff. And all of this was really important for these groups to be attractive to poor and socially disadvantaged groups, particularly women. So we never targeted women. We didn't form women's self-help groups. We just formed groups that could operate in the way that I'm describing. And these groups were attractive to women. Right? You don't have to form women's groups. You just have to have a way of working that's a, appropriate to your customer, and they'll come. And what you see is, initially, we have much more influence of all that pizzazz at the beginning of the project, the four-wheel drives, the expectation of the elites. But as this is the first stage of the project, as it matured, the proportion of agricultural loans that went to women increased significantly, and the number of groups that, and group members that were women were also increasing. Um, and what we're seeing here in this kind of first, well, first two phases through to 2008 is you start off with loans being very small, and over time, the amount of money that people are able to borrow and use and repay is increasing. Right, I'm terribly behind here. So here's the deal. This lady used to be a sharecropper. Then she was able to purchase her animals. This lady 
I remember going with my colleague who's doing impact study, and he said, John, what the hell are we doing? Someone who's standing in front of this house is not poor. And I said, no, that's true. But this was her house, right? And the point was that not through the money that she was accessing, but through the fact that their group had more social capital, they'd been able to access the government funds which were available to them for home construction. Same kind of thing was happening for schools. This lady was really famous. She's a sharecropper. She doesn't own the land that produced all this rice, but she cre created quite a stir because she was producing so much, and she wasn't allowed to sell it because she wasn't registered as a landowner, and the kind of system couldn't understand how a poor lady who clearly had no standing in society had this great big pile of rice she wanted to sell. Um, but it was worked out, and that's, we're talking about that social capital. So now, at that point, we could form groups for 400 rupees, all in. And Suleiman worked for the National Council for a, an Indian policy research organization, and he told us that others were spending between 700 and 4,300 before they paid for the professional time. And Basics, which is another organization in the space, said 2,000 to 2,500 rupees as the cost of forming a group without professional time and overheads. So it's pretty, pretty cost effective. So here we are. We've got to 2006. I've got to do 10 years in about three minutes. Or was it 10 minutes? Do we finish at 10 past one? Is that right? Or, yeah. So I wanted to stop here because something really exciting was happening for me at this point, right? So what you've got is my Indian colleagues within the Indian Council for Agricultural Work research had got on board. They could see that something interesting was happening here, right? And they were starting to take ownership of some of the experiences in that project where I'd had to separate things early on, right? So there was a sense of ownership coming. And I was starting to reflect on things and think, well, you know what? Our project is pretty interesting. If you can get to the point that ICAR signs on and you can get this project, it's pretty low risk for these guys. And they're all guys, by the way. But it's pretty low risk because if it doesn't work out, well, it was a stupid foreigner, right? It wasn't our great Indian-funded research project. It's an experiment, right? But if it does work in a way that's useful, you've got a pathway to ownership. So that was really helpful for, for, for folks in that respect, right? They had some kind of plausible deniability, but if you worked it right, there was a pathway for assimilating and taking on the bits of that experience that you thought were interesting. I said I was going to talk about those research relationships earlier. Here's the kind of thing that I had to do as the kind of international party to this collaborative research project with scientists. So any government around the world, whether it's the US government, the Indian government, the British government, has a whole set of rules and regulations that you have to follow, right? It's not something that's special to developing countries, but we had to negotiate and work out how to get money into a research institute in northeastern India. It's not entirely straightforward, right? There's, um, and we had to help kind of sometimes bypass regulations. And, and you get into a really gray area sometimes about what is bribery, right? Is it bribery when you pay for a senior person from Organization X to fly business class to America and receive a per diem? I don't know. Happens all the time. All the time to attend the meeting that comes up with a drawing that leads to the project that moves forward. Right? And, and there's, that's just one example. So think about it. And, and you know, you could never pay a bribe, but I think we were doing some stuff. All these motorcycles I had to buy. I never saw the things right? in, in any meaningful use, but I bought a lot of motorcycles. Um, but more importantly, there was this moment where people were starting to reflect on this, not just within our project, but within other projects. right? And then the World Bank were funding a program called the National Agricultural Innovations Project. And you know what? This is an output of a project where 
Rashid Suleiman, the guy I mentioned earlier, working for ICAR, facilitated a project that reflected upon our experience and the experience of, of another of a number of other projects funded by all sorts of donors with all sorts of partners on, on what were their lessons, right? And we had from the ministerial level, actually there might be another slide here, strong input from ICAR, ICAR buy-in at all levels up to the ministerial level. We had projects reflecting on their experiences. We had the World Bank NAIP as a customer. And you know, I put this support from CGAIAR in there, not only because some of their projects and experiences were reflected in this lesson learning, but we actually used a methodology that they developed at, um, I'm thinking it was SEAT, Brew Douthwaite was the person. They had this kind of timeline, this methodology to help you reflect on how stuff worked out. So that's pretty interesting. Now, if you think about institutional change and learning, well, we're, it's, we're, it's not only those scientists with the plausible, plausible deniability, but you're now giving people a way to kind of induct that into their activities at a national level and the funding that's going to move them forward. So that's pretty interesting to me. So now, huh, it's probably another government, I should think, at this point. But anyway, NRSP, no more, right? A lot more British scientists wondering what they're going to do with their time because um, it's now about research into use. And so what, what I've done at this point is I've said, look, the costs are there. It's really low cost. Let's see if we can scale this self-help group process up. We came up this, with this thing called Roggi Roti as a kind of branding around what we've been doing. Who knows what Roggi Roti means? Anyone? Yeah, it's kind of daily bread, right? It's your means of living. And it captures this. If, if you use this term in, the, in a kind of Indian context, people love it. It just kind of says exactly what we do. And so our, you know, our colleagues had come up with this way. And this, of course, is the house that people were building. So we're chasing scale. We're focusing more on impact. This around Bihar, within Bihar, around Patna, was where we focused in earlier phases. We now started to move into other districts and other areas. I was kind of intrigued as how, how could we operate remotely. Okay, well, I don't know, as I remember, it's a long time ago, but this came from a final report. We formed the groups, we got into three states and 16 districts, but ultimately we had to cut back on group formation because we couldn't provide them credit. So we were failing to meet the demand that groups had for credit. And I think if you scratch below the surface here, they were probably struggling to support this remote process of dialectic group formation. Um, but in this phase, the kind of things that were coming through, well, we're really now dominated by women's groups. We're reaching kind of socially disadvantaged groups. There's a lot. There's you know. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's not all about agriculture, but we're having an an impact on agriculture. People are having less need to liquidate assets. To you know, remember those assets in the middle there. They don't need to sell you know, the iPhone or whatever. It would not, of course, be an iPhone at that point. Um, in order to meet some short-term need, um, and. This kind of stuff is important that people, there's a, there was a real, really obvious impact in health. And in earlier phases, we'd seen a lot of stuff around um, education. It was less strong at this point because you know, government programs at, at that point had got stronger. The other thing which isn't here, but I remember was also reported, incidents of wife beating go down, right? And interestingly, they, they, there's benefits that are reported within the community where this is happening, even if the person themselves is not necessarily a member of the self-help group. Um, so that was, you know, for a soil scientist, that's pretty interesting stuff. So, so now we're in this last phase. And in, in, in kind of the spirit of, um, I was not directly involved in this phase of the research, and there's a reason why. So 
I'm entrepreneurial, as Julie told you. And I thought, you know what? The groups can pay for group formation out of the interest they're willing to put on their savings that they're rotating within the groups. We have this really low-cost way of forming groups. We're starting to see that we can um, operate remotely. So I wanted to explore how you could leverage that in some kind of semi-commercial way. I didn't want to be tied to the donor dollar because it strikes me you have to put up with a lot of nonsense if you do that. Um, but we couldn't find a way to do it. Um, and of course, the donor dollar was still there. So this Global Poverty Action Fund put some money in to demonstrate. And it's really important work. I'm not saying that what happened was not important. I'm just saying that I was not part of it because it wasn't what I would have done. Um, and so what they did here uh, is they focused back in this area where we'd been working over a number of years. And they said, we're going to form more groups. We're going to rely on what they would call the viral spread. So they formed more groups in an area where we already had a significant footprint. That was a logical thing to do in many ways, right? Um, and I got these updates just by email this week just to try and capture this part of what went on. Well, they reached 100, and we, we'd reached 50,000 people across those discrete locations in the Roji Roti phase. In that last three years, they reached 150,000 people, 28,000 group members and their families at under two pounds, so that's $2.60 per beneficiary. So 260 times 400 million, what's that? Uh, billion, probably. Um, so, you know, spend a billion dollars, you could make a really significant impact using this model, I think. A billion dollars doesn't sound like that much to me. Um, repayment rates are high. They've been focusing more and more on understanding the impacts. And there's a project, a reach product project, that you can look at for that. Um, and obviously, malnutrition is something that people are interested now in. Um, and, but what was happening here, which was interesting, is if you look at the project funds now, rather than the cost of forming groups, so the vast majority of the money was now going into this system that I described to you, which meant that the people who'd been part of this historically in the UK had to work for nothing, which I'm not sure is entirely ethical or entirely sustainable. Um, unless you're rich and you know, have got all of those capitals and assets at your disposal. Um, so, I don't know, this slide, I probably should have spent some more time on it. But I'm absolutely convinced that we demonstrated a process, and I've had enough kind of corroboration over the years to understand that the process we use for group formation has got elements that are distinct from most other organizations. We can do it. At, if you're, if you're operating within a location, certainly, where the costs of the group formation and its growth can be paid for by groups themselves and can be facilitated by local actors. Um, and you know we've got this challenge about how you achieve linkages to money. Um, although we have a lot of data and, and kind of database systems underpinning this, it's probably not bank worthy. Um, so you either end up becoming an agent of the bank, helping banks to lend money. Banks struggle to reach poor and socially disadvantaged people as well. And we can help them extend their reach, just like a mycorrhiza in soil helps plants acquire phosphorus. Or you can become a microfinance institution. So we, I reckoned it was about a billion, right, if we just spent $2 per um, person to meet that $450 million. It would only cost around $10 million to become an MFI. Um, so those are the challenges going forward. I think in, in, in what I hope what I described to you gives you a pathway that you can both have a robust project approach at the natural resource level, but I think there were lessons in here that do have relevance to achieving development impact at scale. Julie, six minutes.